A warm, warm welcome uh, to everybody joining us for session two. We've just had the first session, which was looking at pipeline access financing. Um, and we wanted to move from that into uh, the next session, which is looking at innovation and data collaboration for future NTT treatments. Um, we heard a lot in the first session about, you know, uh, collaboration and, and underpinning that. Obviously, data is a huge um, element of, that, of those collaborations. Um, we're very honoured today to be uh, joined by Dr. Marco uh, Shaito from exec the Executive Director at CPATH Cure, the Drug Repurposing Collaboratory at the CDRC in the United States. And we've also got Dr. Martin Walker from the Infectious Diseases Data Observatory, the IDDO. Um, and also we have um, Joanna Ferneval adams who's at the Bohemia Project at IS Global in Barcelona in Spain. I think we'll pass over the floor for the first speaker, um, Marco, um, from the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory. Um, I think we'll just hand the floor over to you. I'm just wary of the time, so I'm just going to keep my introduction kind of brief. So um, I believe one second, there we go. So Marco, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Cameron. It's a pleasure to be here and I'd like to, to thank the organizers for, for inviting me and, and uh, the, this project uh, to uh, give a little bit of background about what we're doing and, and participate in this uh, fantastic uh, online forum. Um, you know, so CDRC is um, is really trying to maximize the utility of existing drugs for for um, drug development. Um, you know, I, I uh, it, it's been a, a work in progress. Uh, it's something that we've started only a few years ago. Um, but uh, I'd like to give you uh, a little bit of a background on what we've been doing, um, the, the 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 sort of the, the science behind it, um, and also specifically the the intent. Um, and the utility for neglected tropical disease. Um, before I begin, I, I do want to acknowledge uh, a few people that have been helping in the background um, in, at CPATH and uh, Rima Charles and Catherine Serb um, at FDA's end, Claire Bassetti and Heather Stone. Um, and then at the WHO end, uh, Daniel Gagne, um, um, who is the uh, Head of Prevention and Treatment and Care uh, Unit at the Department of Control of Neglected Tropical Diseases, and uh, also Barbara Milani, who is the consultant at WHO to help Daniel. So the problem really here is approved in one uh, agency, not in the other as well. Um, and, but, you know, looking at that, there are a significant number of diseases where there is no approved treatment, and oftentimes the these diseases are of rare origin or neglected. Um, and as a, as a result, um, as uh, many in the audience know, um, there's very little type of, of, of drug development occurring within those, uh, those areas. But we know that once a drug is approved, that physicians take the responsibility of prescribing those drugs for a different indication. Um, and, and this is the, the, the aspect that uh, FDA came to us because although that they don't re regularly re endorse off-label use, um, but they do not acknowledge that it happens. It's a practice of medicine and, um, you know, should we maybe be paying a little bit more attention to what is actually being prescribed in the real world and, and seeing if that can generate some hypotheses uh, for testing um, in, uh, in clinical trials. So uh, before I begin, I do want to give a little bit of background on, on the definitions of drug repurposing, um, because that's really what we're talking about. It's the investigation of existing drugs for new therapeutic purposes. That's, that's fairly um, uh, you know, uh, obvious and also high level, but we do it to really to try to maximize the effectiveness of those current drugs that we have available. You know, The way that the drugs are being uh, approved is through indications, right? So it's the companies that come in and request uh, the, the, the uh, purpose from the FDA in order to get uh, market authorization for a drug and a disease. And that may just not be completely uh, true for, for that particular drug. So what can we learn from our colleagues globally um, as they are utilizing uh, this arsenal of drugs that are available to them? Well, there are a couple of different ways in which we can think about repurposing. One is for looking at shared targeted pathways. Um, that is at the biological target of the, of the drugs, the same, but the disease is different. 
Um, an example of this was remdesivir, right? It's an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase originally for the treatment of uh, hepatitis C virus. Um, and it uh, failed there, but then was uh, transferred over to Ebola. That failed phase two uh, clinical trials and, and then um, was eventually approved for COVID. So uh, that's an example. It's the same target, but it's looking at different diseases. Another way that's a little bit more challenging, but is also quite interesting, is that drugs may be effective through these off-target pathways. You know, oftentimes drugs don't just have that one pathway, but there are multiple pathways. Um, and uh, and that's it was originally probably out of the original scope of the therapeutic indication when it, when, it, when they went for uh, market authorization. Um, and an example of this is like aspirin. You know, it's a very old drug. It's generic. Um, it's traditionally been used as an as an NSAID um, for the treatment of pain and inflammatory disorders. But it also suppresses blood coagulation uh, by inhibiting normal functions of platelets. So again, a completely different mechanism, but it can be used, uh, the same drug can be used for, for, for two different, different things. So FDA actually, uh, back in 2019, um, uh, released a, an app, uh, a platform that they've been developing also with uh, the help of the, the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, it's also known as NCATS at uh, the National Institutes of Health. Um, and this is a, an ability of this uh, platform to share experiences of prescribers, including clinicians and physicians and nurses and uh, other, uh, other groups like that, to contribute uh, their knowledge and expertise on how they've been treating diseases which um, are fairly difficult to treat and they've had to use additional uh, types of drugs to be able to treat them. Um, by sharing this, uh, this, this resource, um, other clinicians from around the world can explore those experiences. Um, sometimes diseases are more prevalent in one place versus another. And so when, uh, you know, when you have that much of experience because you've been treating these diseases uh, for a fairly long period of time, you, you do uh, have a, a little bit more experience on, on how to treat those diseases. So um, that information can be shared with other individuals and other clinicians globally. Um, and it also gives us an, an opportunity to discuss and share those challenges um, if you have questions or if other clinicians have questions for, for your case that you provided. So this is a case, based on a case report form. And there are other applications within this, um, uh, within this uh, platform that includes uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the curation of uh, clinical trials and clinical trial data, um, other events that may be happening, uh, articles of interest, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a one-stop shop for primarily clinicians, but also uh, researchers as well to be able to come in and, and evaluate uh, what's been going on in particular areas. So the goals of uh, CureID is to enhance the understanding of new uses of approved medical products, to facilitate clinical trials and drug development, and to serve as a resource, obviously, for physicians to share that information, especially for um, uh, for diseases where no FDA-approved products exist for their use. Uh, more recently, um, actually about a week, week and a half ago, uh, we actually provided an update to the app, um, and we were basically uh, updated the app based on a number of different uh, uh, users providing feedback on, on ways to improve it. Um, so, uh, you know, these are just four of the sort of high level uh, update and, um, and improved features that we have, including a new way to, to uh, customize the news feed um, for the interests of each individual um, user. Uh, there are now additional filters uh, that improve search and sorting functions and, uh, and access more relevant information that way. Uh, there's an ability to actually upload images. I think this is great for um, sort of skin diseases when you really um, need to, to see, uh, you know, what that in the skin disease actually looks like. Um, there may be some uh, nuances to that that can be, you know, a picture's worth a, a thousand words sometimes. So uh, adding images to case reports and discussions um, actually helps a lot in those cases as well. And this is just new ways of, um, of capturing data in, from the real world and new ways to visualize data. So there's some additional visualization tools that will be helpful as well. So I encourage you to, um, if you haven't, to um, go to um, uh, the app and this is uh, available uh, freely at uh, the App Store um, at, uh, or at Google Play. It, at the center, at core of, of CureID is um, sort of a, a 
basic data requirements um, that we're, we're asking for when clinicians submit case reports. Um, and so this is actually quite simple, very easy. What disease did you, does, does the patient have? How was the diagnosis made? Why was uh, the, the infection difficult to treat? And there may be a, you know, a multitude of different ways. So in, in, in this case, at the right-hand side, you can see that these are primarily radial buttons. So it's not that you actually have to type anything in. Oftentimes, it's just um, uh, sort of a, a, a clicking the best response. Um, a what drug was used to address the difficult to treat infection? Um, in this case, for the most part, you do have to type it in, but there's a, 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 an algorithm that pulls out the drugs based on, on how you're typing it in. Um, and then what was the patient's outcome? Did they get better? Did they get worse? It was about the same. Um, and did the patient experience any adverse events, obviously? Um, there are probably another couple dozen questions for the full submission forms, such as patient demographic information, um, the, the drug dose, route, duration, additional comorbidities, things like that. So we are looking for additional information, but this is sort of the minimum basic requirements. Um, there are a number of different data sources that we have uh, available for clinicians um, to, to uh, submit. Obviously, it is the, 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 the area that we want to explore further and, um, uh, and, and, and engage clinicians. But we know that there are some challenges. There's, um, they, they are very busy. Uh, oftentimes, they can't be bothered. Um, but they like to take a look at what others have done. So, you know, the more that uh, clinicians can submit cases, I think the, the better that it is for the community. Um, questions about submitting off-label use to a U.S. government agency does come up, um, but we're really wanting to try to understand how drugs are being used uh, more effectively so that we can generate the evidence rather than having this uh, um, sort of done anecdotally. Um, and in the U.S., at least, there are some questions about legal concerns, but there's no, um, there's no, you know, you can do this completely anonymously as well. So um, your your name doesn't necessarily have to be attached to it. Um, we do, uh, and what I'm going to provide um, in the next half of, of my talk about uh, ways in which we can um, uh, sort of jumpstart this effort, effort uh, going through the literature. Uh, we do realize that there's some publication bias when, when you go through the literature, but at least it gives us a, a start, an idea of, of what people have been doing. Um, electronic health records, oftentimes pretty costly. We are doing them for other diseases, but probably not particularly relevant for neglected tropical diseases. Um, and then disease, disease registries is uh, another area where we're looking for partners. We constantly look for partners. Um, and there are some challenges with standardization, harmonization, and in particular data sharing. But uh, those are areas in which we can explore and, and uh, address as, as, we, as they come along. So there's been a vision, um, at least from uh, the partners that I've talked about uh, so far, from FDA and NCATS. Uh, for a public-private partnership to really generate um, not only the case collection, but how you then uh, move that to evidence generation and especially dissemination of that information more publicly. And that's where the Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory has come, comes in. And we've convened uh, a public-private partnership back in June of 2020 uh, in collaboration with, uh, as I've said, both FDA and NCATS. Um, the, it's really become a pilot focused on furthering drug development for COVID-19, simply because of the timing, which back in June of 2020. Um, and, and although the, uh, and, and through the use of the Cure ID platform, um, obviously we're, we're interested in pursuing uh, other opportunities. Um, you know, the, the whole intent and purpose of Cure ID has been to look at neglected tropical diseases. Um, and the hope is to build the infrastructure using COVID but that, that would be expanded to other neglected uh, infectious diseases within the future. And the collaboratory will demonstrate how data sharing from clinicians in real time can be used to inform ongoing and future clinical trials based on, on those trial results and potentially um, use those, those results for, for, for drug labeling. Um, there's an interest in exploring, as I said, NTDs from the outset, um, but we understood that there are some challenges. Um, and what I'm going to talk a little bit about is implementa implantation mycosis for, uh, as a demonstration project. And this is actually back uh, earlier this year, we um, actually kicked this off with uh, another ISMDD uh, webinar um, in partnership with uh, the World Health Organization on, on these implementa implantation uh, mycoses. And, and that can be um, reviewed and viewed again uh, through uh, YouTube. 
Um, but uh, these uh, collaboration uh, resulted in sort of evaluation of uh, actinomycetoma, eumycetoma, sporotrichosis, and, and chromoblastomycosis. Um, and the, in, the actual webinar was really key for the launch of the WHO online survey to support that sort of further de dissemination of what's going on in the field, what, what are people doing actually. Um, and the HU and the WHO um, online survey on, on, on those uh, was actually closed in, in, uh, on, on March 15th of 2022. Just a high level overview, about 318 people were approached, 142 provided complete answers. And 138 responses declared their uh, responders uh, declared their country, um, and there were uh, respondents from around uh, 47 different countries um, from all continents. Um, the primary results and and uh, have been analyzed um, with the support of WHO advisors on on implantation and mycoses. The online survey uh, confirmed, um, at least at high level, that there is considerable amount of drug repurposing occurring in all four of these implantation mycoses um, globally. And uh, the, the group of us at the WHO, um, US FDA, and now CDRC um, are uh, having some discussions on opportunities and how to disseminate that either at the WHO publication, the journal article, and obviously uh, our interest uh, remains high for another uh, webinar later on uh, this year. So um, just a, as a little bit of an update, uh, we have uh, started uh, defining the, the terms of reference for a CDRC subgroup for impl implantation mycoses to conceptualize and potentially pilot this group of disease in the Cure ID platform. Um, we continue bilateral discussions with uh, a number of different research teams that we were introduced in, both in Madagascar, Mexico, and Brazil. Um, and uh, are, are going to be uh, working with these groups um, in future publications and presentations and conferences such as in focus in, in Guadalajara later on this year. Uh, there are a lot of challenges. Um, I think that there are, uh, what come with challenges are opportunities. Um, there's no well-established networks for, for implantation mycoses, although there's really a lot of interest and eagerness to work in this, uh, in this area. Um, and, and we've uh, really tried to interface ourselves with the front lines or clinical workers and research teams in countries. Uh, Cure ID, I think, provides that opportunity to support create, uh, the creation of networks and the collection of data, um, which can inform actually the burden of disease, since there's no really um, global systematic surveillance for, for these types of, of diseases. So um, I uh, wanted to spend maybe uh, the next few minutes just talking about um, the, some of the work that we've been doing. Um, and this is a, a result of um, uh, Rima Charles, who's uh, really summarized uh, and done a systematic review to, uh, of case studies that were found in the literature, um, uh, primarily from PubMed. Uh, she screened about uh, 262 cases uh, and 198 uh, case reports were extracted and included for final analysis. Um, probably the top 10 uh, sort of uh, countries are, are listed here. Uh, top three are Brazil, China, and India. Fairly significant number of cases um, found in the literature. And, and as you can see, it's a fairly large tail dropping off um, uh, with approximately about 20% of, uh, of the, these other countries being, being involved. Um, most of these data were in, in, in put into the, um, into the Cure ID app uh, with uh, help from uh, a number of our interns that we have, Ziba Ibis, um, uh, Nalini Oliver, and, and Bizma Ali. Uh, and just to go through a, a just really high level quickly about uh, you know what type of information can be extracted from 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 Cure ID as a result, um, you know not again uh, too surprising. About eighty three percent of the cases um, occur in groups of individuals of between thirty one and eighty years old, with about half of them being um, between forty and sixty years old. Uh, the majority of, um, of patients were, were, were men, uh, and again, uh, obviously, because of the way that the transmission occurs in chromoblastocytic mycoses, um, this makes sense you know, um, that it's mainly men in, in uh, working in the fields um, at, uh, at uh, sort of middle age where we start seeing these types of, of, uh, of infections occurring. Um, looking at the distribution of, of isolated organisms, there's a, again, a fairly long, large tail. Uh, you know, most of this is through um, epidurosi. Um, but there are a number of other um, uh, chromoblastomycoses uh, pathogens that, uh, that result in, in that disease as well. So a fairly large list makes things a little bit more complicated. 
Um, but uh, when we looked at the, the, the way that, uh, that these diseases were uh, treated, um, the drug distribution frequency, at least from 2015 and onward, we wanted to, to sort of see what was happening more recently. It's primarily itaconazole and terebinfen, um, but there are, again, a number of other drugs that are being used um, off-label um, as well. So um, it, this, um, what's been seen in the literature is actually uh, a, a lot what uh, we see in, in the survey is very similar types of results. Um, obviously, uh, when we looked at comorbidities, um, there's a lot of comorbidities um, uh, that were seen uh, primarily, uh, which are results of, um, uh, of compromised immune systems. So um, not su too surprising there as well. And then just lastly, we can also take a look at um, surgery um, and also relapse. And most of those cases that were reported um, were not uh, uh, controlled by surgery or, or did have relapse. Um, this is very similar types of, uh, of numbers that we're seeing, at least percentage-wise, that we're seeing in, in the survey as well. And when we looked at uh, the outcome, uh, the time of that, that assessment was, was done, it was pretty much uh, split fairly evenly um, while a patient was on treatment all the way to um, when the time when the treatment was completed and then after a period of follow-up time. So it seemed to be fairly uh, well um, uh, represented in all three. So some take home messages, just as I, I know I'm running a little bit uh, over time. Um, drug repurposing is a viable drug development method to assess the effectiveness of treatments using real world data. Um, Cure ID is a free public resource uh, that can be an important tool, I think, to capture how drugs are being used um, in the real world and new ways of then generating hypotheses that can then be confirmed using randomized clinical trials. Um, we've received uh, a major update uh, with new features based on, on user feedback. I encourage others to, to check uh, CureID out. Uh, the public-private partnership um, funded by FDA and convened by Critical Path Institute aims to demonstrate how this real-world data can be used to inform ongoing and future clinical trials. That's um, what we're, we're um, going to be, be doing in, in, the, in the coming years. Um, the platform uh, at CureID currently has 198 cases of chromoblastomycosis, but we really do need more cases in order to do better sub-analysis on, on that and to, to get more uh, of an idea of what actually is happening on the ground and how, the, how those patients are being treated. And CDC obviously are partnering with uh, the WHO NTD on, on implantation mycoses, uh, including not only chromoblasto, but uh, others as well, including mycetoma and sporotrichosis. Um, and we're exploring partnerships with in-country registries and treatment centers, um, and really to be able to share this more publicly and broadly through, through the QRID platform. Um, so I'll stop there. I'd like to thank everyone. And again, apologies for, for going a little bit over time. Um, and if you want some more information, I've given you a website and my, my email address. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you. And absolutely, no, thank you very, very much, Mark. It's a wonderful presentation. And, and you're not over time, so it's perfect. Brilliant presentation. So interesting to, and thank you for that. So interesting to see how Cure ID has now morphed, uh, or this has now turned from that point into this we've also we've actually put up the uh, couple of uh, connect sessions one we had with heather stone from qid quite some time ago and then the um the um chromoblastomycosis um with the who and yourselves we put that up so the, the people can actually see that so That's i do fun. thank you for that um it's very interesting actually these partnerships at um registry level um and i just wonder what kind of resistance you're going to get to that um and, and how that's actually going to pan out and how that is panning out. And I'm sure that'll come up in the Q&A um, after the session. So I do thank you for that presentation, Marco. Thank you. There are some questions coming up, uh, coming through, which will weave into the Q&A. Um, and to the lovely audience, I would add, please don't be shy. I'm going to give you a quick shout out. Uh, we've we've got people from Rome. So Dr. Janice Lasdin, ex-TDR person from Rome. Um, we've got Dr. Lynn Mooley from Nairobi. Uh, working with the Cal Research Initiatives, who are actually based in Houston, in Texas, but she's dining in from Nairobi. Um, we've got uh, from the Netherlands, um, we have, uh, sorry, one second, we have uh, uh, 
Professor Lizette van Lyshout from the Parasitology uh, Unit at the Leiden University Medical uh, Center in the Netherlands. Uh, Carolina Batista, Dr. Batista is joining us, who she's just actually speaking in the first session. Um, we've got a lot of people coming on uh, and from Cape Town, Maria Zingas. So there's quite a feel to this. Um, and um, do keep your questions coming in. Thank you all for joining us. Marco, thank you very, very much for that. We'll get to the Q&A at the end. And I'll just, uh, I'm going to introduce the next speaker for the uh, session. We heard there really about uh, the, the amazing effort there uh, from uh, garnering real world data and informing trials, um, informing kind of treatment pathways and all of that. And it's a wonderful effort and that we've kind of tracked from its inception really to now. Great to see that moving forward. It brings us to our kind of clinical data sharing kind of effort. Uh, another take on this from the uh, Infectious Diseases Data Observatory, Dr. Martin Walker from the IDDO. Uh, Martin, I'm just going to introduce you to the floor and just hand over the floor to you. You're going to be talking about the IDDO's clinical data sharing platform and their take on the future of NTD treatments. Um, Martin, over to you. Uh, if that's okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can I just check? You can see the uh, the slide. Perfect. We can see it perfectly. Hear you perfectly. I'm just going to back out. We can see and hear you perfectly. Thanks. Brilliant. A lot. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to start by just um, thanking the organisers and uh, Marianne in particular for the invitation to speak. Um, it's a great honour. So good. Good morning and good afternoon to you wherever you are. Um, my name's Martin Walker. I'm, I'm based at the Royal Veterinary College and Imperial College London. Uh, in the UK, but I've been working with the Infectious Diseases Data Observatory, or IDO, um, for a number of years on our portfolio of NTD data sharing and, and reuse platforms. So um, I'll just start by giving you a, a brief overview of our, um, our vision, our mission, if you like. Um, so we are we're a data sharing and reuse um, portfolio of platforms actually with a with a mission to improve the treatment and control of, of poverty related infectious diseases. Um, we do this by generating um, robust research evidence through the, the reuse of clinical data, um, most frequently in the form of individual participant or patient um, meta-analyses. So we follow um, three fairer principles which I've I've listed on this slide, uh, findable, rapidly available, ethical, equitable, forever accessible, interoperable, reliable, economically viable and reusable. Um, but you can go into a, a little bit more detail if you if you want um, on these principles of data sharing. Uh, if you look at a recent uh, white paper that was published in, in Springer Nature. Um, and just I'd say a, when I used to introduce um, IDO a, a few years back, I, I would always dedicate at least one slide uh, or a bit of time to emphasize the importance of, of data sharing in, in research. But I think now um, it's fairly safe to say this is much more widely accepted so that the power and importance of data sharing is, is more widely accepted. And perhaps this is um, being emphasized um, from experiences in the recent pandemic or the ongoing pandemic um, where data sharing has been has been key to the the global response to to COVID-19. So I, I mentioned that EDO is um, a, a portfolio of data sharing and reuse platforms. It started uh, many years back now with the worldwide um, anti-malarial resistance network WARN so you can see that here in the top left hand corner. Um, but since then it's it's expanded um, to include a portfolio covering 15 diseases and, and research themes. Um, and seven of these are, you'll see seven of the diseases are named on the um, WHO list of NTDs. But all of these are um, disproportionately affected impoverished populations. So irrespective of whether they're on the, uh, the official NTD list. So a very brief um, overview to the, the, the structure of our operational platforms and um, some of them, I, shall, I will go back just, just one slide there. You can see that um, the ones in red are, are fully operational, um, then uh, in blue we're 
building and then uh, in the, the darker color, we, we're scoping. So looking at the, the feasibility of developing these platforms. But at least for the, the fully operational platforms, um, they all have a, a similar operational structure. So researchers can contribute their individual patient data via an online web portal. And these data will be um, cleaned, standardized, curated um, in-house by our team. Uh, we use a CDISC format for standardization. And th this process will all be done in consultation with the, with the contributors. So there's often lots of nuances to data and we need to, to fully understand them. So there's, there's a constant dialogue between the curation team and uh, the contributors to make sure we get things right. Um, and then these data are held in a, a uh, what we call a, a gated repository. Um, and from there, third parties can um, apply for access to, to these data. Um, and the decision on whether to, to grant access will be either um, from the original contributors of the data, so they can, they can maintain control, or frequently data contributors will defer that decision to a, a data access committee, which is um, currently chaired by uh, WHO TDR. So these, um, when people have access and reuse the data, the goal, as I mentioned briefly, is to conduct often um, IPD, individual patient data meta-analyses. Um, and, and the goal there is to, to generate robust evidence that can inform policy, treatment guidelines, um, and in course, and of course, um, publications. So I, I don't have a, this on the slide, but overseeing this whole process, we have um, scientific advisory committees of experts for each individual platform or theme. And then there's a, an EDO board um, comprising uh, often chairs of the individual SACs, and they um, provide overarching governments to, governments to uh, EDO as a whole. So um, before I move on, I, I just wanted to to show you this slide, which is it's a little bit of a um, a frequently asked question slide based on our experience of um, talking with individuals, uh, um, research communities about what exactly we we are, what we do, and and also what we're not. So we are a um, gated repository for individual level clinical data, and what I mean by that frequently it's data on infection or disease um, measured before or after treatment, um, as an example, to give us an idea of um, how efficacious a treatment may be. Um, I mentioned the word gated, so uh, applications to access the data and reuse it must be approved either by the, the contributors themselves or by the data access committee. Um, and we're a promoter of uh, the free, fairer principles of data sharing. Um, and one particular feature of this is there's an obligation built into our um, um, uh, data access agreements um, that oblige any users of the data to actually work with the original contributors as well. And any um, outcomes from that, be it a publication or a change of policy, uh, will involve full credit to both the people doing the um, the analysis, but also those individuals who, um, or teams that originally generated the data. Um, we are a registered data repository, um, which can be used, for example, to comply with journal requ um, requirements to make data uh, available or um, funder requirements uh, have similar requirements to, to make data widely available. And we're also a hub to facilitate and promote research. And, I, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in, um, in later slides. So a couple of things on what we're not. Um, we're not really in the business of um, population level epidemiological or programmatic data. And uh, we've been working a little bit with um, uh, WHO SPEN to make sure we are aligned um, and we can cross refer um, each other when people frequently people may um, come to us and uh, maybe have data on I don't know what's happening in different populations through mass drug administration for example we're not really in the business for that type of data but there there is of course the SBEN portal um, which we frequently direct um, 
potential contributors to. We're also not what we would call an open access data dumpster. Um, and anyone interested in this concept, I, um, I'll refer them to this lovely paper by Laura Merson, which in, uh, appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, emphasizing the important, importance of useful data sharing. So um, it's not that useful uh, if people are, say, required to, to share their data by a, a journal or a funder and they just make it available on some random uh, website. That's not particularly useful. Um, so we were we promote useful and managed data sharing rather than this random disposition of data all over the internet. Okay, so in terms of facilitating and promoting research, I, I wanted to spend a, a little bit of time um, talking about how we, we try and do this. So I'll focus on, on two areas. Uh, the first is the development of research agendas. So each of the active platforms in the EDO portfolio will have um, a research agenda. Um, and we do this um, in consultation with the, the scientific community and, and also in a, in a public consultation phase. So broadly, the, the process will start with um, the EDO team uh, scoping the literature, looking for uh, research gaps, things that could potentially, questions that could potentially be answered if all these data were put together in one source. We'll then draft the agenda and we'll send it out to um, experts that we've identified, if you like, for a, a peer review process. They'll give their, their feedback, we'll amend the agenda, and then it goes out for a period on, on the EDO website for open review. So we, we publicize it and make it um, available for, for anyone to comment on. Um, the goal of this whole process is to try and, well, capture as, as much as we can about what could be the potential use of um, bringing all these clinical data together, but also to start promoting um, engagement from the abroad of range of individuals as possible so we get a really um, inclusive and, and collaborative environment for actually um, conducting this research. So if you want to um, learn more about the, the approach we have to developing these research agendas, there's a, a paper recently out in uh, Welcome Open Research. That one focuses on the process we went through for schistosomiasis and the soil transmitted helminthiases, but it's a, it's a cross-platform approach, um, so applicable to, to any of the other IDO um, platforms and research themes. So the second key way um, that we try and promote um, and facilitate research is, is through the formation of, of study groups. So these study groups are, are somewhat um, a product of our data transfer agreements that compel users of data to um, get in touch collab and collaborate with contributors. Um, but they also serve as a, a transparent and open call to other interested parties to get involved in the research that has been initiated. Um, the idea here again is to create a cohesive and inclusive hub for conducting the best possible research. Um, frequently these study groups will be initiated by, by third parties, so not internally at EDO, um, but we can provide the platform and, and the outreach to to make these initiatives as, as visible as possible um, to maximize engagement with the community. So I've, I've just put up some examples here um, of the, the study groups that are ongoing for visual ischemoniasis, um, but you can find similar things on the, for, the other, um, for the other platforms. So in terms of um, and, and really to, to, to wrap up, in terms of where we are going in the future, um, I mean, the, there's happily progress for NTD treatments um, these days. I've put a few examples here. This is um, uh, no means by no means comprehensive, more the ones I'm particularly familiar with. So many of you will probably know that um, uh, the triple jug, uh, ivermectin, diethylcarbamazine and albendazole is now being pushed and promoted by the, the WHO for the treatment of lymphatic filariasis. Uh, moxidectin has recently been registered for the treatment of onchocerciasis. It's also useful for scabies and um, trials are ongoing um, to look at its efficacy for uh, soil transmitted helminths and other parasites. 
Um, albendazole ivermectin co-formulation is, is being trialed, um, looking for uh, more efficacious treatments for SDHs, tool transmitted helminths, pediatric praziquantel for schistosomiasis, um, and then uh, a couple at the bottom there that um, DNDI have have um, been successful with, so fexanidazole um, and nifertimox eflornithine combination for um, trypanosomiasis and new reg regimens of um, benzinazole for Chagas disease. So really our goal is to um, engage and to, to serve these initiatives, these various organizations that um, are conducting these, these trials and generating new individual uh, patient data. And I'll, I'll quote again at the, at the bottom there from the, from the white paper. So, um, cause I think it summarizes very nicely exactly where we are trying to be. So we're, we're bridging the data sharing gap between the individual researchers or groups who are collecting the data, um, funding agencies, publishers, um, and standards authorities. So that's really where we we're positioning ourselves, where we want to be and where we think we can serve the community as a whole to, um, to get the most out of all the data that um, are being currently generated. And I'll finish um, just with um, what is really the key to our successful partnership with all these um, organizations and um, teams, initiatives, trust. So we, we've, we've got our trust um, acronym here for terms. Um, so this is having um, formal agreements, being aware of um, good ethical practices, um, giving credit to um, both those who do the reanalysis, but also key, the people who generate the data originally. Um, research and response, so um, having a research agenda, for example, a, a clear purpose and capacity to, to do this. Um, universal use and utility, of course, we want to be useful. We want this, um, the research that's generated using the data to actually have impact, to change policy, to improve treatments. Standards, curation, anonymization, quality, um, and of course, the, the technology that um, is behind all this, um, so servers, security, and software. So I will finish there. Um, lastly, I will just um, acknowledge our funders. So this, there's a broad array of funders that are involved in um, different aspects of the, the EDO portfolio, um, but these are some of the, the predominant ones. I also want to th thank um, Matt Brack at EDO for, for helping me put together this um, presentation. Um, and also, of course, to the, the Society for the invitation. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much. And if you want to get in touch, here are um, our details. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for that, Martin. Fantastic presentation on the IDDO's platform there. And some I love that terms acronym at the end. <laughs> Uh, some very interesting points raised in that, which I'm sure will come through in the Q and A. Um, really, uh, at, at the end of the session. So, you know, in terms of this kind of the multitude of clinically important kind of associations, kind of between ethnicity, demographic, social, clinical features. How do you kind of, you know, capture all of that? I'm sure that will start coming through um, in the uh, Q and A. We've had some questions come through from the audience already, which we appreciate. Uh, thank you for that. But do keep those questions coming through. Um, you mentioned the magic word ivermectin. Um, you are looking at ivermectin, DEC, and albendazole in, in lymphatic filariasis on one of your slides. And you mentioned it again in terms of uh, co-formulation with uh, al albendazole. And um, when it comes, that was on your presentation. The pre previous presentation was a little bit of a pivot on repurposing. And ivermectin has really been in that kind of... Um, zone in terms of attracting attention on repurposing the pandemic pushed it somewhat forward for probably the wrong reasons but um certainly it's in in the news as it were and on the on the nexus of all those kind of points which kind of neatly brings us into our the last presenter for this uh, session we wanted to involve the bohemia project um from is global in barcelona um uh, and we wanted to bring you know somebody who's actually on the ground doing working in this kind of area and see how those platforms in terms of the, the uh, 
Cure Drug Repurposing Collaboratory and the IDDO's platform, how they might impact uh, this type of research, as it were. So I think that's enough from me, and I'd just like to pass the floor over to Joanna Fernival adams from the Bohemia Project, um, talking about ivermectin for malaria. So I think a round of applause and a warm welcome, Joanna, and I'll back out. We can see your slides, uh, and I think we can hear you as well. You might just want to say Hi. something. Yep, there we go. Perfect. Okay, yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Joanna and I'm a PhD student from Barcelona Institute for Global Health working on the Bohemia Project. And I'll be speaking about ivermectin MDA for malaria and also the potential consequences or implications for MTDs. So I'll start with a brief history of ivermectin for endoparasites and then mosquitoes. Then I'll give you a brief summary of current research in ivermectin MDA for malaria. I'll then go into a little bit more detail on the Bohemia project. And finally, I'll touch on the potential implications for NTDs. So ivermectin was first discovered in the 70s in a project in Japan where they were screening samples of soil and looking for bacteria with antimicrobial properties and they eventually isolated ivermectin from streptomyces. It was first used just in veterinary medicine against helminths and later filari. And then in 1982, the first trial uh, in humans took place in Senegal, and that was uh, to look at the effect against onchocerciasis. That eventually led to the Mectazan donation program, which started in 1987, and Merck, uh, committed to donating ivermectin to anyone that needed it wherever and for however long they needed it for onchocerciasis and then later from 98 onwards that was also used for LF. And in 2015, 2015 a Nobel Prize was given to three scientists for anti-parasitic drug discovery, two of which were responsible for ivermectin. And the Mexican donation program is still ongoing. And today, around 3. Point billion doses have been distributed. The story for malaria was slightly different, and research progress was very slow to begin with. In 1978, uh, the first report of insecticidal properties of ivermectin um, was published, and that was against ticks. A few years later, the, the first mosquito experiment took place, and they showed an effect against Aedes, Anopheles, and Culex species. However, despite that, there was very little progress in the next 20 to 25 years, with only six papers published between 1989 to 2009. In around 2010, insecticide resistance began to be an increasing problem for, for IRS and, and bed nets. And so that sparked a bit more interest in ivermectin. And today there are five active clinical trials. And also by 2024, um, if, if the, the trials generate positive results, then WHO will likely give a recommendation. So the five trials that are ongoing, um, they've vary slightly in terms of regimen and dosage. Four of them are based in Sub-Saharan Africa, one in Thailand. And the Massive trial has published some results showing a reduction of 70% in malaria prevalence and a reduction of 80% in inc incidence. And the other trials are ongoing and there should be a clear idea of what the recommendations will be like by 2024. So I've been involved in the Bohemia project, which is uh, two is two cluster randomized control trials based in Mopea, Mozambique, and Kuali, Kenya. The trial in Mozambique has already started. It started in March and is ongoing. And the trial in Kenya is due to start in 2023. We chose the two trial sites based on differences in malaria epidemiology. Uh, there are slightly higher rates of transmission in in Mozambique compared to Kenya. There are also differences in vector species composition, differences in rain patterns and environmental conditions, different livestock species and housing, differences in housing and human behavior. 
So the intervention is 400 micrograms of, of ivermectin per kilogram, and that's given three times over three months, one, once per month. And the three intervention arms are, well, the first one is the ivermectin is given to humans and livestock. In the second arm, the ivermectin is given to humans only. And in the control, albendazole is given. And that was for ethical reasons, given the known effects of ivermectin on worms. So the primary outcome is malaria infection incidence in children. And we also wanted to monitor some of the secondary outcomes on some of the secondary effects on scabies, head lice and tunga. And scabies and head lice were chosen given the known efficacy of ivermectin against those two. Tungiasis is more of an exploratory, um, an exploratory question. It's very highly prevalent in the trial site in Kenya, so I wanted to explore that. So I'll just go into a little bit more detail on, on those secondary outcomes. Scabies is typically diagnosed through by a medical doctor, and it involves full inspection of um, inspection of the full body. And typically, individuals suspected of scabies will have a, a skin scraping taken, and that will be confirmed under the microscope later on. Because we were screening such a large number of people, it, it was just a subsample of the participants, but it was still a large number. It wouldn't have been possible to do that. So we used a simplified diagnostic process and we trained field workers with no medical background in scabies and head lice diagnosis over two days. And the diagnosis was based on a questionnaire with very basic questions on symptoms and contact history. And they examined exposed skin, so legs and arms, and marked the appearance of the lesion and the number of lesions to indicate severity. And so based on this information, um, the participants either got a diagnosis of not, no scabies, clinical scabies, or suspected scabies. We used a similar method for head lice, and we plan to use a similar method for tungiasis in Kenya. And we do plan to validate this and assess the diagnostic accuracy in the next few months. So I don't yet have full results from the Mozambique trial, but I do have some baseline prevalence data. Uh, we didn't really know what the prevalence of scabies was when we started the trial, so I couldn't find any publication on scabies in Mozambique and very little data. But, so I was quite surprised that it was 11.6% and for head lice it was 10.5%. The operational experiences were challenging. As I said, the drug was de delivered three times three months in a row and that was at the peak of the rainy season. So that alone would have been challenging, but we also experienced five cyclones just in the build up to the MDA. Um, that was unprecedented for Mozambique and led to unexpected levels of flooding and a cholera outbreak. Uh, despite this, we did manage to achieve high coverage and few re refusals and generally a high acceptance of the inter intervention. So what are the broader implications of ivermectin MDA for malaria for NTDs? On the top left, I've included a map of malaria, and you can see that um, most of the cases are concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa. I've also included maps of onchocerciasis, lymphatic filariasis, soil transmitted helminths, and scabies. And you can see there's a fair amount of overlap between all of them, particularly for LF and onco. However, as Martin mentioned, the treatments are treatments are developing and control tools are improving um, and the maps are shrinking. Um, so for example in the trial sites, onchocerciasis was considered eliminated in both sites and for LF, MDA had recently been stopped for both. And so in two years by the time this becomes a recommendation, if it becomes a recommendation, the situation may have changed quite substantially. For soil transmitted helminths, usually albendazole is used as 
used for MDA, but there are some some helminths that respond better to ivermectin. So, so these areas may benefit from that as well. As for scabies, ivermectin is typically used as treatment for scabies. And more recently, it's been informally recommended in MDA. Um, so I do anticipate benefits in scabies as well, although the regimen for malaria is slightly different to that recommended for scabies. So some final questions that I have if the trial results are positive. Firstly, are there ways the regimen or dosage can be optimized to improve the effect against MTDs? So for example, Onkosakai, I think for onchocerciasis, I've mentioned it's re recommended twice per year, but often this doesn't happen. So I'm wondering if I've mentioned MDA from Larry could complement these programs. In terms of op operational synergies, there may be ways that we could optimize resources and reduce costs, given how complex and difficult the operation is. There are also some common challenges across all MDA programs, particularly for ivermectin, such as systematic non-compliance, for ISIS mapping and deline delineation of transmission zones. So I wonder if with increased commitment, we'll be better able to address these challenges. So I, I want to thank everyone involved in the project, particularly the staff and researchers at CISM and Kemri and our funders, Unit, Unit Aid. Thank you very, very much, Joanna, for that brilliant presentation. And we wanted you there because it's kind of a real world example of how these platforms can probably impact on your work. And there's a kind of a lot of crossover in that. Um, so thank you very, very much for that. Um, I'd just like to bring all the panelists back, if possible, for a short Q&A. We're supposed to finish this at 2.45, which we've run over a little bit. Let's so probably go over that by about five, 10 minutes, if that everybody's okay with that. Um, but I just wanted to kind of start the, the Q&A, if that's okay with everybody. Uh, Martin, are you there? Uh, we can't yes, see, I'm here. There we go. Just, uh, we can't see you. I think your, no. video, your video just, just needs to go back on, sorry. Yeah. On? Uh, we can hear you, but we can't see. But we, but we can go with that if, if that. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, if that's <laughs> okay. okay. I usually do that on a Monday Monday morning. <laughs> I don't want to shock the other people, so I usually do. But that, that's completely fine. So I mean, firstly, thank you very very much for some excellent presentations. And we think there's a lot of balance in the in the session, the two platform providers, and then a, a real world kind of look at you know how this might be used in a in a setting, as it were. I just wanted to ask a question first okay. to the two. Um, uh, the platform uh, providers, as it were, to Martin, um, uh, we, can, we, we can ask. Uh, there are two kind of questions really that spring to mind, really as kind of supply and demand kind of issue, as it were. So on one side, uptake, the, the, these platforms that you've got, and we've tracked your idea, as it were, all the way through, really, from its inception to where you are now. Uh, and certainly we know the IDDO with Philip uh, Guerin has been on a connect session with us previously. There is demand for this. There's a huge demand for it. It's obvious. And you've got good uptake and you've got that kind of um, move, um, kind of uh, usage of the platforms. So the question from that kind of supply side, as it were, how do you generate even more uptake? What are your plans around that? You know, I mean, and I can ask... Um, we'll ask Marco that first, if that's sure. it. Sure. In, in actual fact, we we collaborate with uh, the Edo platform. Um, you know, our our sort of uh, efforts in in launching this has been around COVID. Um, there's just um, you know a significant amount of funding available for that, and that's where you sort of have to go. But it's always been with the eye of saying yes, we're going to do it for COVID, but. Uh, we're going to take that infrastructure and then also use it for neglected tropical diseases. And it, it's a very similar to the way that uh, that Edo operates as well. So, um, you know, I think from from our perspective, uh, going through this route, it's been a challenge to be able to ask clinicians to, to take time out in their day 
um, at the end of their day, they will say, okay, um, let me think about, you know, all the treatments that I did. And, and then, you know, um, now I have to go to this app and I've got to do that. So it's, um, it's, it's a bit of a challenge and a chore to do that. And so we figured, you know, is there, are there better ways? And, and, you know, the one way that we thought is going through electronic health records. And, um, and so we've started, uh, we were actually funded last year um, to do that and develop tools to actually uh, embed these tools within uh, a, a hospital system or a clinic um, so that they um, can press a button on their end eventually yeah. um, and do an automatic upload based on a search algorithm that they have themselves designed and have uh, curated and, and, and said that this is okay to share. Um, and again, uh, what our purpose is, is that we don't think that we need everything. That we don't need the entire uh, database of, of what they we just need very small detailed pieces of information just to see you know is there something else happening here um, and we're, we're doing this within the US system but uh, we're very interested in exploring this more globally yeah. uh, and uh, with the, the virus registry they do have roughly about another 25 countries outside the US mm -hmm. um, where they're collaborating and doing this and, and they're very interested you know that's the that it, the bottom line is that people are interested in, in collaborating, yeah. they don't have the, the, the resources, uh, the funding and the time to be able to do this as effectively as they can. Yeah. And so by developing these tools, we hope that that will help speed um, yeah. the ability of people to be able to do this. That's very interesting you say that because one of the points in the earlier session was that people never really know that was about financing from pipeline to my no one really knows who to speak to when it comes to the funders or the financing kind of side of things as a research scientist difficult to know who to speak to so having these tools that would facilitate kind of an easier kind of passage to 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 to, to uptake if you do that's a fantastic answer thank you for that marco martin what's your take on it in terms um, of increasing uptake I think yeah, so, the registries there and, and bringing those on board from your point of view slightly obviously different what, what would your what would you be your plans in terms of increasing uptake so there's i mean there's a slight difference with in uptake depending on on the theme of cdo so i mean um uh, marco you mentioned covid um malaria there's there's always been a very um strong uh incentive for for people to share data those with those things there's a lot of interest there's funding for those those platforms so um to a certain extent they are somewhat easier i guess to to maintain um good uptake and engagement where we've had more of a challenge is with um some of the the ntds so uh, my most of my experience has been on developing the shisto sdh platform and initially we came at that um, from the perspective of we need to put together all the data that have been generated largely in the past, because as we know, if, if you don't, if no one does it, those, those data end up being lost, which is a, a terrible shame. For, well, we would argue it's actually not particularly ethical because people have uh, participated in those trials, given their, their time, their consent, you generate the data, they, they generate a publication and then they're lost and, they're, and their power isn't fully used. So, um, we came at that perspective for initially for, for the Chisto STH as an example. We're also doing that in lymphatic filariasis. But the trouble is looking backwards isn't necessarily a great way to um, uh, sustain funding. Um, yeah. So fortunately, I'd say, and this goes really to my, my last slide that I showed, fortunately at the moment, there's quite a lot of going on for NTD treatments, which is where we have to go now um, to work with those um, groups, those those teams that are actually generating new data. I mean, you know, it's just, I think it's just our the human condition that the new data are going to be slightly more exciting to people than than what's been collected in the past. But we you need the past data to be able to compare with the stuff that's being generated now. A nice example is with the triple drug therapy for LS. Loads of good data are being generated now, but the there have been trials of um, the the dual therapies um, they were conducted a long time ago some of those data are lost so it becomes actually difficult to compare how much better is the triple drug compared to giving the two, the two drugs um, and so we, we need to have those data in <laughs> uh, all in one place to be able to do that it's yeah. there's just a balance between you know and, and often it does come back to funding as, as Marcus says we, we need to be on 
on top of the what's yeah. going on now, the exciting stuff, to working with those groups, so we can also um, put that data alongside um, more historical data that are, are still available in some circumstances, but yeah. sadly, all too often do get lost. That, that, that's, that's a great answer, and I really appreciate that, Martin. And I, I, I suppose we'll spin that around and ask Joanna, I mean, uptake of this platform can you you're working with ivermectin and you've mentioned tingitis you've mentioned lymphatic filariasis you've mentioned uh, scabies uh, and you also said you know something about 10 percent prevalence in some of these areas not a lot of data out there on those kind of how how do you how do you view these platforms would you would you can you know how how does it how does it sit with your research kind of uh, outlook I'm um, sorry for the background noise. That's all right. Um, There's builders on our road, which I keep having to unmute and mute because we can't get them to stop, so don't worry. We can't hear anything. Yeah. I think from my point of view, uh, it would be more operational um, data that I would be interested in. I mean, yeah, as I mentioned, MDA programs often have similar challenges, and I think that kind of data would be really, really valuable. Hmm. In case to see a specific type of um, a data set. And that actually brings us into the flip side of the question that I was trying to say. I mentioned supply and demand, uptake for the supply, but from the other side, making data available, right? Well, what? Are you, how available is that data? How are you? you know, how transparent? You, you know that that kind of question. And I'll ask that to to Marco first, right. in terms of uh, tr to generate that trust at registry level, to generate that. How do you go about doing that? How available is that? How accessible is it? Right. So th that's been one of our uh, the things that I'm I'm actually more most proud about um, because I do think that all of this needs to be publicly available. It's mm -hmm. not just for you know a researcher that wants to come in. Yeah. Um, and and if we're doing things in a way that um, that the that the amount of data is so limited. Uh, it doesn't have any personal identifiable information. So uh, we have age ranges, for example. We, um, you know, we don't uh, carry the, the person's name, obviously, uh, no other personal identifiers. And if it's, it's that, at that level, uh, you know, for the most part, people have said, okay, well, if that's all the data that you need. We'll be happy to do that. Um, there are groups that still, um, you know, and I think GDPR is is a, a little bit of a, a challenge, but there are opportunities, and I think uh, groups that are, are looking at that way to be able to do it more effectively. Now, having said that, uh, one of the things for COVID that we've learned is that um, the the scientists that are doing this, saying, you know, that's great to have these twenty or thirty variables that you look for 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 this, but you know, we would like to have additional information. And if we're going to go into the electronic health records, we'd love to pull all the laboratory results out. We'd love to be able to do all of these things. So we've acquiesced in that that, uh, that case and have said, okay, well, rather than just these 40, maybe what we'll do is we'll gather still a fairly significant amount of data now, maybe close to 180 or 200 different variables um, and not make that necessarily public, but do very similar to what uh, Edo is doing. And we're partnering with Edo to do this, to be able to use their platform to say, okay, for this larger set of data, let's do that. And so by collaborating this way, um, we actually can they'll hit two birds with one stone. So it's that same data yeah. publicly available yeah. and our um, nuanced data with additional information uh, made available to researchers that um, that apply to a platform. So That's I think- good great opportunity that we're, we're now starting to collaborate more effectively and okay. utilizing the resources that we have to be able to better better share that for differences in which ways people are, are wanting to use the data that's a fantastic answer actually i, I appreciate that i was going to say your your platforms are very much kind of not synergies or 80s word but there is that there um and i wonder if the, you actually answered that as one of my questions actually i was, I was going to ask so brilliant uh, that's very good to hear um Martin, your take on, on, on that, on the flip side of it, i.e. the data you've, you generate, you've got, how available is that? You said something like a gated um, kind of, uh, repos you know, look. How open are you to, to people for, for your data, the availability of it? Yeah, so the, um, um, the availability is through uh, a, a very brief um, proposal. So, so we do, I mean, some of the, um, the, the, the procedures we've put in place have been driven by the, the communities that we 
you're essentially working for, so the people who generate the data. Um, this may change over time. So uh, I was involved very early with the um, uh, Chisto and STH uh, initiative, mm -hmm. and uh, we got quite a lot of pushback <laughs> yeah. this about making data just freely available to anyone, no questions asked. Um, yeah. They didn't want to do that. Um, I feel like that will change and we can see it changing actually because when more and more when people submit their data that as I, I mentioned in the talk there's the option that people can say i want to have a um essentially a moratorium on this data being used i, I want to see every request and i can approve it or not um there there are good reasons for that i mean we, we don't want to say get in the way of people publishing their primary data for instance so they may have generated the data they haven't got a chance to to publish it yet and they they want to make sure that no one starts um, publishing their data before they have a, had a chance to. So we, we do have that contributor control yeah. built in. But actually, we've seen that, especially for data that have been generated um, years ago, more and more people are just clicking the button that says, you deal with it. You, mm. We defer our, our um, uh, responsibility to, uh, for that to the Data Access Committee, yeah. which is a, yeah, it's still a committee that has to review whether um, reasons for getting access to the data are reasonable legitimate yeah. um but more and more we're seeing people just um say fine we we uh we defer to the data access committee so it's it's ever changing yeah and you know in ntds i think it sharing data is still a little bit new um, yeah it's, it's come a long way but i mean you you could parallel it with what people do when they generate i don't know uh genomic data or something exactly. yeah they, they just share it make it available yeah. anyone can get it um they're I mean, totally certain, comfortable with it and, 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 <laughs> and there's, there's a great answer i was just just gonna just to pick up on something you said there that's mm. a great answer you've given actually uh, you're touching into ethical ethics and, and actually legislation and governance in fact uh, when it comes to this kind of data share uh, we were in singapore a week and a half ago and um, even in a dengue, it was for a dengue, some dengue work, and even in terms of uh, dengue endemic regions, countries are not that good at sharing patient data with each other if they need to do. So the question, I suppose, uh, is a question, how much of a need is there to develop kind of the overarching regulatory kind of framework or legislative framework or ethical principles? We all seem to be adhering to our own kind of versions of it. But to scale this out, you need a regulatory kind of framework for that. Uh, what are your views on that? And, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a, a great question. Um, so we, we do come across this problem. So, uh, I mean, in terms of um, where Edo is primarily based in, in the UK, Oxford, they, they have a, they've been through their own um, ethical committee and they have a, a waiver on, on having to... Um, yeah so they, they can use data that as long as they've been submitted under ethical approval from where they were generated mm -hmm. so if so if a contributor has done a study they've gone through their ethics wherever it was and they submit their data there's no problem with there's no ethical problem with reusing the data from from the edo side we do come across um sometimes um contributors are mainly it's they're unsure whether they can share mm -hmm. data with with edo whether that was uh, I mean, often it's not explicitly built into original ethical yeah. proposals that yes, we can share this data with a with a third party sharing platform. Mm -hmm. um, and so sometimes people want to go back to their ethics committee um, because yeah, as I said, frequently it's not made explicit so that, that we do have that problem sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah, if there was some overarching framework that would be fantastic because mm. sometimes we just can't we can't do anything if someone is not sure or um is unclear on the on the ethics about sharing their data then we it's no good to say well it's okay from our point of view and in, in from oxford we've had clearance mm. that that doesn't matter because doesn't they, matter. yeah no so that yeah. is a that is a an issue yeah okay and, and just and thank you for that uh, answer and Martin, just to morph that to bring in Joanna a little bit, you mentioned you know, obviously the primary endpoints you're looking at malaria infection and in children, but you, the secondary endpoints, the scabies, head lice, tungisus. Let's say I know it's early on in the project. Let's say you show some positive because we've all know the backdrop in terms of ivermectin working in these particular areas. There are there is a 
growing body of work indicating we probably will have a result and you will have let's say you get to that point where you're showing clear kind of you know how how are you going to then are there plans to scale up bohemia into those uh, kind of you know communities or there are already people working on the ground in scabies there are already groups working in headlights in tungaisis how are you going to bring those people together through data or, or how, how do you envisage that let's say you have positive results joanna how do you how do you think that will roll out and evolve into these other kind of areas uh, disease settings uh, your your volume sorry yeah you're sorry yeah sorry yeah, i always do yeah. that yeah <laughs> i mean yeah scabies and tungais are both really very neglected yeah um especially in sub-saharan africa I mean, there's just very little data anywhere. So, I mean, yeah, it's difficult to say. I, I hope that diagnostics will improve. Mm. I can see, I can see that there was a TPP published recently, and they're looking for something that will that, that will work in the field, um, a microscopic tool that will work in the field. Mm -hmm. So, I'm and I'm also expecting a recommendation for MDA for yeah. babies. So. Um, I hope that there is just more engagement in scabies and yeah. there can be more collaboration between malaria and NTD communities. Brilliant. And that does definitely need to happen. I know the WHO are pushing for cross-sector, um, you know, cross-talk and cross-sector multidisciplinarism. Uh, I think now obviously is the time for that. Um, Mark, any last points on that? So I'm being told we're going to have to wrap it up. So would there be any last points in, in, in terms of that? Yeah, I was going to mention for, for uh, the data sharing what the drivers are. And, you know, a decade ago, there was very little sort of data sharing occurring. Yeah. And, it, and really, it's these platforms. It's the Edo platform. It's all yeah. these other platforms that are starting to come up that allow now more yeah. data sharing. And some of that is being driven um, by the funders. So the funders are saying, hey, if you're going to fund your project to do this, we want to yeah. make sure that that data not only gets out on the publication, but the actual metadata comes out as well. Yeah. And that's shared more, more broadly and publicly. And and so there are drivers initially that were for the public good. Well, I'm going to do this because I think it's the correct thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other drivers that are people saying, well, what's the incentive? Yeah. What is the incentive for, for me to do this beyond yeah. the public good? Mm -hmm. um, and that's um, where I think a lot of uh, the employers really need to step up. So yeah. uh, to be able to say, look, we're not going to also just count your manuscripts that yeah. you have published and where you've published. But how many times have you actually now contributed your data for public good to a to a data platform like you? Yeah, that's a very good idea. <laughs> that, you know that that then becomes a driver. If that now um, links to my ability to advance my career, not only on based on publications, but on the amount of data that I've shared, I, I think that that would be brilliant. That's a fantastic answer. That's a fantastic answer, and a, and a, a new vista opening up <laughs> in terms of, of the future. That that's brilliant, and I thank you for that. Um, we're going to have to kind of. I'm going to have to end the session. Sadly, um, Joanna, there were some specific questions from Dr. Janice Lasdens regarding ivermectin malaria and a couple of points that she made. Um, we're unfortunately not going to have time to bring that, but what I will do, and Janice, thank you for sending those through. Um, I apologize, I haven't got enough time to actually get into that, but we'll, I will, if that's okay, I'll send those forward to you, if, if that's okay with you, Joanna, and, and the panel, just to make sure that we yeah. can honor the fact that Janice asked it, those questions, that would be very uh, useful and, and good. Thank you, we appreciate that. Um, fantastic session, food for thought. I always leave these sessions thinking there's never enough time, we need another hour, two hours to get really into this. Um, maybe in the future we could think of some kind of connect session around this or, or just to pull out the, these ethical kind of frameworks and regulatory kind of frameworks that do need to evolve for the next stage to, to start in terms of the scalability of everything. Um, so potentially there's something that we could uh, think about for the future, but I'd just like to say thank you very, very, very much to, to the, uh, the, the panelists, to Martin, to Marco and to Joanna. Thank you so much for a wonderful session.